It is my great pleasure to give you an introduction on biohybrid materials and show some of the approaches that we have taken recently. And uh, as Aalto University was uh, founded to combine arts and sciences, I will also illustrate some of the uh, science that we do with uh, some of the more artistic works from M.C. Uh, Escher. <coughs> so I would actually like to start with a question for the audience and you can join the discussion by raising a hand if you wish. So I would like to ask uh, whether you have been ill during the past year. It's maybe a bit provocative question but uh, <coughs> uh, and then the next question is that did someone have a flu during the past year? Yeah, many people had a flu. Why did you have a flu? That's because you were infected by a virus. Probably it was a influenza virus. And uh, viruses are, are basically everywhere. If um, you had lunch today, you went to the cafeteria and uh, ate something, probably you consumed uh, millions of, of viruses. But uh, you didn't notice because most of these are not infectious to humans. So there's a lot of uh, virus particles around and uh, this is the, say, the biological approach which has been much studied. So how viruses can uh, infect us, how they can bind on certain uh, cells, how they can hijack the, the cell to do their evil deeds and then uh, multiply and then cause an infection. But our question is, uh, is a bit different. So my question is that uh, what does a chemist or a material scientist see when you look at a virus particle? So the first impression that you get is that, wow, it's a very monodispersed system. And there's a lot of different areas in such a particle that one could modify through chemical means. So we could, for example, put something to inside the virus. We could modify the junctions in between the proteins that make up this capsule, or we could decorate the surface of this. But no matter what we do, we will do synthetic modifications for the material. And that eventually leads into a bihybrid material. And now, what does a bihybrid material contain? That will contain a synthetic part and a biological part. So for example, here is a example from our research. This is a crystal structure uh, composing of, of virus particles and synthetic gold particles. But no matter what uh, kind of material you're making, if you combine synthetic materials and biological materials, then a biohybrid materials uh, w will be uh, gotten. And uh, why would such a material be important? Here we have a schematic image of a protein that has a synthetic molecule on it. And now if we consider that what are these biological parts good for? For example, uh, <coughs> uh, a protein in this case. So if we have, for example, an enzyme that is capable of catalyzing chemical reactions in very efficient and uh, specific manner. If we have a, for example, antibody, then these molecules can actually recognize their binding targets very efficiently and again, very specifically. So very highly specified systems have been achieved by biomolecules. But then if we have a synthetic material attached, those can be extremely versatile. So we can tune the properties of the synthetic material through chemical design. And uh, then we can choose basically ad hoc the properties that we want to impose to our biomaterial. And then this kind of a hybrid material in the end can then combine the best of the synthetic and the biological uh, material type. And uh, these have found important applications. Uh, for example, one can do enzyme catalysis in organic solvents. Enzymes are usually water soluble, so if we want to have a chemical reaction going on in an organic solvent, we can attach a long polymer chain 
which is organosoluble on the enzyme, and then it will be soluble into an organic solvent. Or we could have uh, an antibody that is able to recognize a certain uh, cell type, for example, in your body, and therefore it can target drug molecules into that certain location, for example, a tumor. Then we could also have a large molecule that could uh, protect our delicate biomolecule if it easily degrades, then this uh, larger molecule on it, for example, the polymer, could act as a shield against degradation. And uh, then if our uh, uh, biomaterial is extremely well defined, then it can also act as a structural unit in, in some applications. But then where do such materials come from? Obviously, you cannot go to the supermarket and buy them yet, so you need to do something in the lab. Uh, <coughs> many biomolecules are actually nowadays available from uh, different biotech companies. So those can be uh, commercially available or they can be produced by the modern techniques of uh, biotechnology. Uh, some uh, materials uh, can be bought, yes, but some cannot be. And uh, most of the time if you have a natural material, you can obtain it uh, from uh, its natural uh, host or uh, place in, in nature. And for example, the virus particles that uh, we are researching, these can, be, can actually be made in, uh, or cultured in, in laboratory. So what you uh, should do if, if you want to make a batch of virus particles, then uh, you need to go to the supermarket and buy a bag of beans. For example, black eye beans, these are available from the local supermarket. And uh, then these can be grown, so you pot them, you let them grow under plant uh, lamps, and then you get healthy plants. And these can then be infected uh, with uh, virus stock, let the infection spread for a week, and then uh, the plants can be harvested. So then you need a milk shaker, you put all the leaves in there, you make a homogenate out of it, and then with the series of uh, centrifugations and precipitations, one can actually isolate all the par particles. And here is an example of a transmission electron microscopy image that shows uh, <coughs> uh, how the virus particles look like. And here one can easily distinguish the spherical structure, which is extremely monodispersed. So that is an example of how to prepare a, a biological material. But then, how about the synthetic uh, side? So then, you need to work in the laboratory and go to your fume hood. And uh, then, one starts to combine different chemicals. One needs to very carefully consider the structure and reactivity of, of those molecules. And then, simply by taking two molecules, exposing them to given conditions, stir it maybe overnight, and then this reaction chemical reaction will take place. Then one can isolate the molecule that you were after. You need to characterize it, purify it. And then if you got the molecule that you were after, then you can continue. Or if you failed, then you need to go back to start and reiterate your synthesis. So if you got the right compound, you can continue to the next step, again to the next product and so on and so on, until you get to the structure that you were after. So this is target-oriented synthesis. Uh, <coughs> if you are not familiar with, uh, <coughs> with such uh, uh <coughs> techniques, then I can show you that it, yeah, it will consume a lot of uh, chemicals and in the end your, your fridge will, will look like this. So it's, uh, it's full of these different chemical components that are used to make these, uh, these molecules. And if it has been a while since your chemistry class, one can also think that this is a kind of metamorphosis of, of molecules. So you start with something and then with a stepwise uh, manner, you move closer to your target and then you have your material transformed to what you were after. In this case, birds and uh, fishes with wings. <coughs> And now we have the 
biomolecule ready, the synthetic molecule ready, and these can then be conjugated together to make the biohybrid. And uh, <coughs> this is, for example, an actual research example that we have made taking a serum albumin that is a, a protein that is very abundant in your bloodstream and tagged with it with a polycationic uh, uh, molecule that is known to bind DNA extremely efficiently. So now we have a hybrid where we have taken a biomolecule that naturally does not bind to DNA, but through the synthetic modification it can do so. And this can then be used for different biotech applications. So I would like to give you two research examples that we have been working on recently. Uh, <coughs> and these are illustrated again with the works of, of M.C. Escher. The first one is how to make uh, crystalline uh, materials out of synthetic components and biological components. And then the other one is to take uh, a cage-like structure, again a virus structure in this case, and how to fill it with a uh, given component. So let's start with the, with the first one. So here we have uh, <coughs> uh, taken two different uh, uh, building blocks. A virus particle, which is an extremely monodispersed uh, building block. And then a, um, a synthetic uh, uh, nanoparticle and combine these. And uh, if one controls the conditions extremely carefully, then crystalline material can be obtained. And now this particular crystal structure that is forming is a result of the extremely monodispersed structure of the biomolecule and then of course the chemical conditions where this uh, <coughs> reaction takes place. And then we get a crystalline structure. And in the crystalline state, uh, this could, for example, be a mean to protect virus particles against environmental threats. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, for example, uh, maintain the long-term infectivity of, of virus particles. And what is very unique with this approach is that it, the crystal actually contains of two different components, which is very difficult to achieve. So now we have actually uh, yielded a material that comprises of two different uh, uh, building blocks in a very uh, precise manner. Then the second example is how to put something inside a, a virus particle. So we can start with, uh, with the native virus particle and then all viruses contain also a genome inside the particle. So that is the uh, <coughs> The, the genome that the virus uh, proceeds to the next uh, generation of, of particles. But that can be removed and only the structural component that makes up the capsid can be isolated. And now if this can be isolated, we can then offer a synthetic component, in this case a custom-made DNA structure for the virus. And these capsid uh, proteins can then bind on that DNA structure and then enclose it inside it. So now we have made a custom uh, unit that we have, been, we have placed inside a virus particle. And now this of course relates to the first slide. So the questions that we are now asking is that uh, could we use such uh, materials to uh, <coughs> to, for example, deliver a given cargo into a cell and uh, then, for example, use this as a, as a means for therapy. Or uh, could we use this kind of a capsule as a way to protect whatever we have placed inside? <coughs> then I would like to give you some notions also on, on tenure track and uh, how it has been when one has been working at, at the Aalto University for the past uh, uh, three and a half years on, on tenure track. And uh, what I kind of observe is, is that one goes in cycles. So much of the, the activities that we have are of course related to research and especially to publishing and then also on educating students. And uh, on, uh, on publishing papers one starts with 
well, planning your actions, doing, then checking what you got, and then in the end you iterate this until you have results enough that can be published. And then one writes a publication, sends it to peer review, gets the referee comments, sends it back again, and then finally paper might be, for example, rejected, and then you need to start the process all over again. Or you have, uh, for example, a course at the university, you give it uh, during one year, and uh, students go through the course, and then they <coughs> go on and do great things in their future, but then during the next year, the next students come, and then the process starts again. But uh, what is common with this is that uh, one goes in cycles, and sometimes it's difficult to see whether you are going upwards or, or downwards. But in the end, you will go around. And then what I also embrace in this profession is the fact that, uh, well, you get to do great science, you get to educate people, you get to interact with, uh, uh, with society, but then you also learn something about yourself. And uh, at best, science offers you the possibility to learn something of yourself. And in the end, through your results and, and work, you will see a reflection of yourself. I have saved the, the most important slide for the last one. This is the acknowledgement. So nowadays I have unfortunately little time to be in the, in the laboratory myself. So these are the people who have contributed to the science throughout the years. So I'm very grateful for all the hardworking students and postdocs who have contributed. Then I'm also extremely grateful for my former supervisors who have given me so much insight and inspiration. Of course, also the collaborators around the world. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge you for the kind of attention. Thank you.